introduced her to herself, she was able to see who she was, and now she's able to turn, turn, turn you up. So you see, it's, it's reciprocal, it's collateral. If I touch you, you gotta touch somebody else, and then you're gonna touch somebody else, and together we all get touched. And it's because you took the first step to be introduced to yourself. So we want y'all to stand up and get turned up, turned up. Second, you are quiet for a period of time. If I say be still, that means that you don't move. If I say be gone, it's not just you walk out and walk back in, you leave. So the first part of becoming is be, so it's a state of. Now the second part is coming. Now that means that you're moving from one location to the next. When you're coming, you're moving from one location to the next. When I left Mobile, I was coming to Kansas City. I was on my way. I was taking a journey. So becoming is a state of moving from where you are to where you want to be. But the next part, it says the best. Not the worst, but the best. Now, when it says best, we oftentimes use numbers to quantify them. The best football team, the best basketball team, the best lawyer, the best doctor, the best attorney, we use things to quantify. Them. So when we talk about the best, when it comes to us, we can say we're the best father. That's one part of our We're the best son. That's another part of our We're the best friend. So there are many aspects and areas of our life that we can be better at. So we can't just say, well, I'm a good employee over here, but I'm a terrible husband. That's not the best you, all of you. 
Some of us are going to stop at one little spot, one little place. I'm good here. And everything else is falling apart. It doesn't help for us to be the best anything if we're not going to be the best everything for us. When it comes to our children, when it comes to our families, when it comes to our communities, are we really making a difference with them? I remember I had a business partner several years ago, and we had a company called 3D Solution Providers. And we did 3D animation and illustration. And during the course of our business, I noticed his attention started to kind of wane from the business. And I tried for a while to try to get him reanimated, get him back engaged, get him back involved. But it got to the point where it's like, okay, listen, there's something, there's, there's a disconnect here. So we had to have a meeting. And I met him at a library and I asked him this simple question. Now, this is, and I do have to admit, this, this is a nugget that I know God gave me, and I'm passing this on to you. Because this is a one size fits all question. The question to him was if you were a business partner, would you want a partner like you? Now, notice the wording, notice the wording now. If you were a business partner, would you want a partner like you? But see, before I could ask him that question, before I could actually put, put my lips together to say that to him, who did I have to ask him? Myself. I had to ask myself that question. And I was honest enough to say, yes, I would. Because I knew what I was doing in reference to the business. Now, this is why I say that question is a one size fits all question because I use that same question even with my lovely wife who's back in the back. Maybe you learned it. That's my way. I asked her one time, I said, if you were a man, would you want to be married to a woman like you? Mm. Yeah, yeah. But, but, but. Before I can ask her that question, who would I have that? Me. If I was a woman, would I want to be married to a man like me? Mm. Mm. It looks different, doesn't it? I've asked my children, if you were a parent, would you want to raise a child like you? Now, most of the time when I ask that question, they're doing something that they know is getting on my nerve and they know they need to stop. And if they're honest enough in that moment, they'll say, no. But before I can ask them that question, I have to ask myself, if I was a child, would I want to be raised by a parent like me? See, what that does, that looks at your behavior. So when we talk about becoming the best you, it's not just compartmentalized. So many of us think that we can just excel in one area of our life and that's it. We're good. We're not one dimensional. I'm not just a husband. I'm not just a father. I'm not just a son. I'm not just a business owner. I'm not just a speaker. If we're going to be the best version of ourselves, that has to encompass everything about our, our financial life, our physical, our health, our emotional, our spiritual life. We cannot just say, I am good, I have a ton of money in the bank. But can't nobody stand to talk. Mm -hmm. well, I'm Facebook famous, what? but I can't pay my bills. I mean, we really need to take the time to put in the work, to become, to become the best version of ourselves. And see, what we fail to realize is that so many people are looking at us. So many people are watching us. They, they may not tell you, they may not say it, it may not come from their lips, but so many people are looking at you. I tell you this story and it never gets old doing my own event back in 2017 in Mobile. I 
I was doing it at a hotel that was less than a mile from my house. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, because inevitably I forgot something. And I had to figure out, okay, I got, I got, I got about 20 minutes. I can run home and get it, but I can't go and come back. I have to get everything in this one trip. And so I get ready to leave, and our youngest son says, hey, Dad, can I ride with you? I said, sure, son, come on. And he gets in the car, and I'm just thinking, okay, I got to make sure I get everything. Is there anything else I need? I'm just driving. I'm trying to get to the house, and without saying anything, without us having a conversation about the event or anything else, us, my, at the time, he was, he was 10. He's 16. He looked at me and he said, Dad, I'm proud of you. And in that moment, I stopped, not driving. <laughs> but I stopped on the inside because I realized I was watching. I could tell them all, they son, you can be whatever you want to do, you can do whatever you want to do. But then when he looks at me, you ain't no what example am I giving you? What am I showing him? What does he have to take with him? Because on his cell phone, everything is good. Everything. Everybody's balling. Everybody. Everybody has everything in him. He don't. He doesn't see the struggle. But at the house, he knows the challenges. See, everything else is filtered. People on TV, people in the movies, people on the big screen. It's filtered. He sees their success. He doesn't know about the struggle they had to get there. Why do our children's heroes have to be somebody that they don't even know? Go down there, folks. Why can't they sit across the table from their heroes? Why can't they have dinner with them? Why can't they have breakfast with somebody that they look up to? And when I realized that, I started acting different. Because I realized, watch it. They look at it. Yeah. But the biggest challenge for us today is this. What do they see? Do they see us talk about ourselves? Do they see us put ourselves down? Do they see us shrink back? Do they see us not fight for what it is we love and care about? What are they seeing from us? There are some people in this room right now that can think back to when they were younger and how they had family members that would go through hell and high water for them. They remember the sacrifice. They remember the things that were done. They remember the gifts that were given. My mom passed in 2014, and I had an opportunity to speak at her funeral. And I recounted, to me, I mean, honestly, it was one of those touching like, memories. Because I can't tell you how many times, you know, school comes in and single mother, two children, and, you know, she's trying to make sure we are first day of school ready. So we got the clothes we need, we got the shoes they need. We kind of want it. <laughs> <laughs> but we were ready for school. I can't tell you how many times I walked past the bedroom door and saw her sitting on the side of the bed and putting safety pins in her undergarments so that she could save money to get us what we need. I saw that. That taught me sacrifice. When we talk about becoming the best you, what lessons are we leaving for our children? Like our nieces, our nephews, what are they seeing? Are they seeing somebody that's self-centered, that's self-serving? Or are they seeing somebody that is willing to forego what they want for the sake of somebody else? The word legacy gets tossed around a lot. People talk about having a legacy. And 
Is there a legacy stop switching? Is it really a legacy? Several, actually about two years ago, I had an opportunity to actually speak on the National Women's Prayer Call. It's a, it's a weekly, actually twice a week, Tuesdays and Thursdays, they would have a seven o'clock Zoom. And we would have an opportunity to talk about certain subjects. And they actually, for the end of the year, they had these pillars that they thought that, that every man should have. And one of them, was consistent. And you know, they asked me to speak that one. And while I was preparing that message, God gave me a revelation. And the revelation was consistency was the second leg of a four leg race. When I started off on my presentation that morning saying that, they kind of looked at me because I'm, I'm on Zoom, I'm looking at everybody's faces, their face kind of balled up, like, what do you mean? I said, well, okay, before you can be consistent at anything, you have to be committed. Because with no commitment, there is no consistency. Can you show me anybody that's consistent at anything, Brenda Ringwood? She has a commitment. That commitment is what drives the consistency. But you show me anybody that's consistent at something over time, they can't help but get better at it. If you bake cakes every week, you start off January 1st, you, have, you know nothing about making cakes. By December, I'm showing up at your house <laughs> with a plate and some aluminum foil. <laughs> because by then, you have gotten better at what it is you do. Your consistency breeds success. You cannot be successful without it. I would not be on this stage today if it wasn't for the consistency that I got from my commitment to speak. But even that, it, it, it wasn't just about speaking. It was about changing people's lives. It was about pouring into others. The reason I'm on this stage is because of you. We talked about becoming the best you. I can't be the best me without you. If I was in my backyard right now saying everything I'm saying, they would call the people in the white coats. <laughs> and they would haul me away. But, the, but here's the reality. When I understood that I had more to offer and more to give, I couldn't just keep it to myself. <laughs> but the kicker is this. You have more to offer. You have more to give. And you can't just keep it to yourself. Dr. Miles Monroe said the fruit isn't for the tree. And your gift isn't for you. <laughs> This was somebody else. You know, I really, I really wish I could make this problem. And I'm, I'm going to have to work on it for next month. Because I think this is the easiest way for children to understand. If I had a table up here with a glass and a pitcher, and the pitcher had lemonade in it or fruit punch. And it, and it looked like you could pour it out, but inside, I had to seal. To where when I picked up the picture and hold it over the glass, nothing came out. I tried it again, and, and nothing comes out. And I'm sure that this would resonate with young people because they were like, I want, I want some lemonade. OK, well, hold on a second. Take it and pour yourself. But well, it's not coming out. It's not coming out. 
care what it is you have in you. If you're not willing to put it out, who is it helping? Who are you helping? Who would be the smartest person in this room? But nobody would know. You've heard it several times the most, the richest place in the world is the graveyard. Why take stuff with you? A lot of people, a lot of people have a hard time believing. I used to stutter as a child. I'm serious. I had a stuttering problem. And if you would have told me when I was younger that I would be up here on stage speaking to people, I would have been like, you, 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 you crazy. <laughs> because I, 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 I didn't do that. And that's the way I used to talk. But listen, listen, listen. When you realize you have so much in you that you have to get out, yeah. nothing can stop. You put in the work. You'll get some help. You'll find somebody. And you know what? I, I did so much on my own. I used to volunteer to read in class. Now, I'm not saying that I've always been the person I am today. Believe me, I am not. But I am becoming. Even then, I didn't want to to stay stuck and stay. I didn't want to stay in a corner. I didn't want to have people always talking about me. And some of those same kids that are joked, that joked me when I was young, I wonder where they are today. My point is, I didn't let what they thought about me or what they said about me change what I knew I had to do. So when you realize how valuable you, you are, and you realize how valuable your gift is. See, if God didn't need you here, you wouldn't be here. Somebody needs what it is you have. Somebody needs the gift, the ability, the talent, the arms, the ears, the eyes. Somebody needs the touch that you have. But if you don't see it as that, if you don't see that as valuable, you'll hide it. You'll discount it. You'll put it away. You won't share it with anybody. But once you realize just how valuable what it is you have, you fight like hell to get it out. You do whatever you have to do. You'll get as much help as you need. You'll take as much time as you need. You won't quit until you've won because you realize somebody is waiting on what I have. You are the aspirin to someone's headache. Wow. <laughs> Somebody is hungry for what you have. Don't leave them starving. I walk in the room, you tune me out. I show up, and he don't, he don't understand me. I can't relate to him. But when you show up, your story, your background, your history makes them sit up, makes them take notes, makes them say, you know what? I need to talk to her. I need to talk to her. I need to encourage them because they have encouraged me. When I thought about doing this, you know, so many things that ran through my mind. But I definitely, I definitely want to make this, this point here. That there would be no me without you. Now, I'm not trying to take anything away from God, because believe me, he's the one that has me here. But the mission that God has given me is not for me. See, if you leave out of this room thinking that Sakon is a great keynote speaker, I failed. Because that, that wasn't my goal. My goal was to help you to see yourself in a different life. People think, people think I spent millions of dollars with the marketing firm to come up with my slogan. Of Sakona Press, of SakonaPress.com, where we make motivation personal by introducing you to yourself. I didn't, 
had to consult with anybody other than God about that. You know? But see, the reason I was able to do that because he first introduced me to myself. See, until you really understand what it is you have, you can't see clearly what it is you're supposed to be doing. It doesn't resonate with you. God started to show me the type of person he made me to be. The type of friend, the type of father, the type of husband he made me. And once I understood that, again, I started valuing. I saw what God needed me here now. But he needed me not for himself, although I do give him glory, but he needed me for my fellow man. God blesses us through each other. And there are so many people that have spoken on this stage. They have gifts and abilities and talents that are going to help you get to where it is you want to go. But if you don't recognize that you have something to offer, like Mr. Stamp will say, you'll step back. Like down the phone, say, you'll step back. You will withdraw yourself because you're like, I don't have anything to offer them. I think we spend too much time looking at other people's backyards and what it is we think they have. And we don't spend enough time seeing our own worst. A good friend of mine, Judy Lane, she told me, she said, Sigourney, you don't have a gospel of salvation. You have a gospel of self-worth. And I say, that's it. That sums up what it is that is near and dear to my heart. Because I believe, I believe that once you truly understand who you are, like my theme song, nothing this time. All the way. Nothing. For so many listen so many days. So many days. Not valuing who we are. What signal is that sending? What message is that sending? What is that giving to those around us? It's not just about us. It's not just about what we consider to be important. There are so many people that are waiting for you to just shine, to be who it is you were called to be. Because just like my son, they're watching. You can think of somebody right now, somebody, if you didn't come home to me, what would they If you didn't continue to thrive and to grow and to share, there's so many people that are just, they, they are depending on you. I was telling a young lady, if I could send her this shape I said, if I knew everybody I was supposed to impact, if I had a list, I would call them up, we would grab a cup of coffee, we would go get lunch, we would do something. I would go to that entire list and then I would, I would be done. I'll find something else to do. But since I don't know who they are, I got to keep coming up. I got to keep showing up. I got to keep talking. I got to keep sharing. Since I don't know who I'm supposed to impact. But what about us? How do you show up? Now, not everybody may be on stage, and that's fine. But there's somebody still looking for you to show up. When are we going to realize how important that is? I take it to heart. Encouraging. I take it to heart. Showing up for folks. I take it to heart. Because I know for a fact that somebody is listening for what it is I'm saying. Somebody needs it so bad. And again, I realize God has given me something to share with the world. Who am I to say, well, I'm not tall enough. That's a joke, by the way. Thank you, Terry. <laughs> Just a little sidebar fact, when I went to Africa, my nickname was Giraffe. <laughs> I think you got too funny. But I can't let anything keep me. Because it's too important. You talk about commitment, consistency, success, but that's what the legacy part is. What do you know of? If I want to say the name Michael Jackson, 
neither do you think of music. If I were to say the name Michael Jordan, neither do you think of basketball. They are legends in their own right. But their legacy was cemented in their success. The success came as a result of their consistency, even after being cut from his high school basketball team. But that consistency grew out of a ground of commitment. So my question to you is, what are you committed to? Or better yet, what do you want your legacy to be? I mean, since the end goal is legacy, what do you want to be known for? When people mention your name 100 years from now, what do you want them to think about? Say, what is it that you want to be known for? If that's your legacy, you need to get successful at doing something. Because only you be successful at it to get you consistent. That consistency won't, it won't stay if you're not. So many of us in this room, have so much to offer. Some of us in this room are shrinking and shying away from the thing that's going to take us to where it is we're supposed to be. So many of us in this room are afraid of what somebody else would think or say about us. Yeah. And yet we're still sitting in a prison of unfulfillment, in the prison of mediocrity, just so. Nobody sees us. Nobody calls us. It's not even about that. It's not even about that. Again, I'm not doing this for myself. Let's probably say that the number one fear in the world is public speaking. I ain't quick to tell people I'm afraid not to. The reason I'm afraid not to is because I realize I've been given something valuable. Just for me. So any, any opportunity I get, any chance I get to talk to somebody, any chance I get to, to actually have a conversation with somebody, any chance I get to pour into somebody, I do it. All this knowledge, all this insight, all this, all, all of this, none of it is, is, is supposed to stay in here. In my book, I wrote a Fifth book, by the way. Leadership that last Woo! I talked about. Thank you. <laughs> I talked about leadership starts on the inside, but it doesn't stay there. Leadership starts on the inside, but it does not stay there. Because when you realize what you've been given and what you have, you cannot, you cannot keep it to yourself. Somebody once told me that the sin of the desert is not telling people where water is. If you have the answer, if you have the solution, if you have a way out for somebody and you keep it to yourself, it's messed up. It's messed up. All of us have something we have to offer. All of us have something we can give. The question is, are we going to do that? Because we talked about Become. That was over here. The best was here. And I'm going to finish with this. If I ask you about this room, do you love yourself? Most people say yes. Most people say yes, I do. I love this. Some of y'all will question your response. We sometimes think so little of us. And I know, I know, I get it because I've been there myself. You know everything, most of the bad things about yourself. God knows everything about you. He still loves you, by the way. He knows everything about you. He still loves you. That, believe it or not, that particular around the cross. But when it comes to you, we will tear ourselves down. We can be our own best friend or our own worst enemy. Yes, sir. But if you realize that even you standing in the way of the gifting that God has given you to give to somebody else, that's a travesty as well. It's not just about what other people want to say about you. 
It's not just about what other people are going to try to do to hold you back. What are we doing to ourselves? When, when we're so self-centered, when we're always just focusing on us, we can't see the people who are supposed to help. We can't see the ones that are looking for us, the ones that need us, the ones that want to be encouraged by us. We can't see them because we're always just looking at ourselves. And when I say looking, I'm not talking about in a way to be better. We just, we are criticizing ourselves. We're tearing ourselves down. We're saying, I don't have enough. I can't do enough. I'm not worthy enough. What, what am I going to do? How, how, how am I going to accomplish this? But when you realize that the gift you've been given is more than just for you, when you realize the difference that you have that you can make in the life of somebody else. All of those nahayas, all of those nahayas, you'll, you'll find a way to get past it, even if it's your fear. I used to tell people, I look for fear. And I'm gonna grab it by the throat, and I'm gonna drag it to where I'm supposed to be. Because when you realize how important it is that what it is you have, you cannot just let any of the hang up stop you. I had a chance to speak in Africa a couple, well, last month actually. And I was interviewed by <laughs> Jefferson Consulate Hyphen. <laughs> and I had a chance to do an interview with a video production company. And they created this amazing scissor reel. I was like, I would hire this guy when I saw the reel. But then I shared about the importance of seeing your value and what value your value brings. Seeing your value and what value your value brings. Because if you don't see your value, if you don't see how valuable that, that, that cup of water is to somebody that's dying of thirst, you'll spill it, you'll waste it, pour it out, you'll use it to clean up your tennis shoes instead of going to the person that needs it the most. We spend so much time tearing ourselves back. So much time saying what we can't do. We spend so much time not realizing that we have the answer to people's problems. We have a chance to make a difference in the lives of those that we've been called to serve. But if we don't, if, that's, if that doesn't register with us, what it does, it puts us in a place and in a position to where we're not happy, we're not fulfilled, the world is not better. The gift that you have, what it is you can do, what it is you're good at, what it is you've been called to, is needed today, right now, more than ever. And I don't care what you've been telling yourself. I don't care what story you've been actually feeding yourself. You need to rewrite the story you've been telling yourself. You need to realize that somebody somewhere is crying because you haven't showed up. They're in pain because you haven't stepped out. They're upset because you haven't made your podcast or written your book or wrote your play or fried your chicken, whatever it is you've been given to do. They are somewhere eating bad chicken because you don't want to go in the kitchen. You don't want people talking about you. There's someone looking at a jacked up yard because you don't want to grab a lawnmower and go out there and cut grass. You've been given a gift. And it's oh, let me see. I gotta get down there. Some of y'all look. You've been given a gift to give to the world. Do not, do not go to your grave with that gift. And even if you say, I'm too old, you're not 
As long as you're breathing. I heard this one coach say, those that can't do, teach. If you can't do it anymore, fine, instruct somebody. Show them how to do it. Show them it can be done. Give them an example that they won't forget. Dr. Ruben West told me this, and I'm a pro. He said, God is an experimental teacher. And I had to co-sign that because oftentimes we'll ask for stuff and we expect an answer, and God will take us through an experience. But why does he do that? Why does he do that? So that we don't forget. If I called out my phone number right now, right now, in a, a year from now, actually what it was, some of y'all probably wouldn't quite remember. But because of this kill, because of the experience that you've gotten, because of some of the things that I've shared with you, you're looking at yourself differently. You realize that somebody, somebody is, somebody is looking for me, somebody is dependent on me, someone can benefit from me. And some of them, I don't even know who they are. So when you understand that, we don't stop. We don't get sidetracked. Yeah, we may stumble, we may fall, but we get back up. Because again, until you know who you are, anything is. But once you know who you are, how valuable you are, how talented you are, how gifted you are, how blessed you are, how incredible you are, how amazing you are. Oh, yeah. Once you know that, once you really embrace that, again, nothing can stop. Listen, my name is Sakoni Prince of SakoniPrince.com. Well, we are motivation personal. Thanks to you, to yourself. And I want you to know that nothing can stop you. You're all the way up.